Hi, name's Kevin, and I'm going to make this as quick and as simple as I can because we've got jobs to do. But this is important, really important. In fact, if you don't do the things I'm going to show you, you could end up sick, disabled, or dead. Yeah, it's that important. Now look, there are lots of different ways to get hurt. Uh, here's an easy one. Okay, the danger here is real obvious. I can see the danger coming, and I know if I don't do something, I'm going to get hurt right away. But the danger I'm going to tell you about today is different. It's a danger you may not see or feel when it's hurting you on the job. You may not even realize what happened until months or years later when it's too late. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. There are ways to protect yourself, and that's what this video is about. I'm going to show you some respiratory protection equipment and how to use it. But I can't make you use it, and I can't babysit you to see if you're using it the right way or that you're keeping it in good condition. I can only tell you that if you don't, your health, maybe your life, could be in big trouble. Not in a fast, obvious way like this, but trust me, pay attention, please. E.D. Bullard Company makes personal protective equipment. We and your employer are committed to keeping you protected on the job. So in certain workplaces, we need to provide you with special equipment. Because without it, you could get sick, you could become disabled, you could die. Now, we've taken the extra step of creating this video to make you aware of some respiratory hazards in an abrasive blasting environment and to show you precautions you and your employer must take. Here's what we'll cover, and all of it is important. Number one, the potential health risks of a typical abrasive blasting environment. Number two, respiratory protection equipment. Number three, respirator use. And number four, respirator maintenance. If you have any questions after watching this video and reading the instruction manual, ask your supervisor or the person in charge of your safety program, or call the toll-free number that I'll show you when we're all done. Your life and health may depend on it. Okay, just what is it that's so potentially harmful? Well, that's simple. During a typical abrasive blasting operation, dust particles are generated while you work. Those familiar dust clouds are a big bother, of course, and they do contain potentially harmful particles. But it's the less visible and microscopic dust particles that present the most serious health risks. For example, when you're blasting paint off a rail car, a bridge, or ship hull, airborne contaminants are released into the work area. If the paint is lead-based, then lead dust is generated during blasting. If the abrasive material used to blast the surface is silica sand, then silica dust is generated. Lead and silica dust are only two potential deadly enemies. There are others, too, like asbestos, and exposure to these dust particles over a long period can cause both temporary and permanent damage. Silica can mess up your lungs, and lead can mess up your entire body, your blood, your nervous system, kidneys, bones, heart, and reproductive organs. Severe cases involving either of these substances can cause death. So, my first point is, know the hazards of your work environment because there may be harmful dust particles in the blasting area. Okay, how do you protect yourself against the contaminants that are present in an abrasive blasting environment? Since your work area may be contaminated with harmful dusts, federal law says that your employer must give you written procedures for the use of abrasive blasting respirators and provide you with approved respiratory protection equipment. The respirators should be selected by an industrial hygienist or safety professional who is familiar with the hazards of your work environment. There are four basic components to an abrasive blasting respirator. The approved system includes a respirator helmet or hood that covers the head and neck, a cape that covers the neck and torso, a breathing tube with an airflow control device that connects the respirator helmet to an air supply hose, and an air supply hose that connects the breathing tube to the air source. All four components must be present and properly assembled to constitute an approved respirator. Oh, by the way, what do I mean by an approved respirator? Well, an approved respirator has been tested and certified by NIOSH, an agency of the federal government. 
This approval is your assurance that a respirator will do what it was designed to do. OSHA, that's the part of the government that covers worker safety and health, requires something called a type CE continuous flow supplied air respirator for abrasive blasting applications. These respirators not only provide respiratory protection, but also protection from abrasive rebound. Your employer is required to measure and monitor airborne contaminant levels in the work area so they'll know the right kind of respirator to give you. And they're supposed to repeat that monitoring periodically to make sure that your protection is adequate. So my second point is, follow your company's safety rules and wear an approved respirator when hazards are present. <laughs> If you're falling asleep and you don't remember anything else I tell you, at least remember this, because this is the most important part. Respiratory protection equipment doesn't do you any good, any good at all, if you don't always use it and always care for it properly. If you fudge it even a little, it's like not using it at all. There is more to it than just throwing the respirator on and plugging it in. Now, I know all these procedures can be a pain, and you might think that just once you can get away with bending the rules. But listen to me. If you avoid or ignore these procedures, even a little, you are taking a risk with your health and your life. Now, here's just what I'm talking about. Right now, these guys are risking their health and their lives. Can you spot everything they're doing wrong? And remember, any one thing can make your protection completely useless. Keep this scene in your mind as we review some good practices for using your respirator, and we'll come back to these guys later. Now, when you are issued a respirator by your employer, the very first thing you ought to do is read the respirator instruction manual, approval label, and warnings. Since the instructions are written by the manufacturer who designed and built the respirator, they're an excellent source of information. Instructions can help you understand how your specific respirator works, they also include warnings that you must understand and follow. Failure to follow the manufacturer's instructions and warnings could result in your exposure to contaminants, endanger your health, or cause your death. You got it? If you don't understand something you read in the instruction manual, ask your supervisor about it or call that toll-free 800 number that I'm going to show you later. So, how do you use the respirator? Well, first of all, all of these steps must be completed in a clean environment. Your employer should provide a clean area for you to put on the respirator. If you're dealing with lead, your employer must provide an OSHA-compliant facility, like a decontamination trailer, so you can put on and take off your respirator properly and be protected from the environment. Street clothes should be kept in a clean and uncontaminated area. Separate lockers or storage facilities should be used so clean clothing is not contaminated by work clothing and shoes. And believe me, you don't want to take this stuff home with you. Now on to the respirator. Make sure that all the necessary components are present and in working condition before using the respirator. Now I talked about these components earlier. A respirator helmet, cape, breathing tube, and air supply hose. And these components should be inspected regularly and replaced if damaged. Okay, now after inspecting your respirator and before entering the work area, connect all four respirator components. Connect the respirator's breathing air hose to grade D or better breathable air. Now what does that mean? Well, it means it's the employer's responsibility to make sure the air is breathable. Grade D isn't like a report card grade. It's an accepted standard for breathable air. The air source, the place where your breathable air is coming from, must be located in a clean air environment, away from the contaminated area. And hey, make sure the air intake is not located anywhere near the exhaust pipe of any equipment. Well, otherwise you could send deadly carbon monoxide right into your respirator and you'd be out of here real quick. The air source must be clearly identified as breathable air. If it were not clearly labeled and you were to accidentally connect nitrogen or other harmful gases, <laughs> you could die. So don't guess. If you're not sure of the air source, ask your employer. Do not hook up to an air source that isn't known and clearly marked as breathable. If your breathing air is coming from a compressor, 
Here are the components required. An airline filter with sorbent beds, pressure regulators and gauges, relief valves set no higher than 125 pounds per square inch, and a high temperature alarm and or carbon monoxide alarm. Make sure the air supply system is working properly before connecting your respirator. Check it out. Never modify any of the components or override any of the safety controls. They're not there just for looks. They are there for your protection. Next, with the air flowing into the respirator, adjust the air pressure at the point of attachment to within the approved pressure ranges. These ranges are listed in the instruction manual and on the respirator cape. That's right, look it up, it's important. Then put on the respirator and recheck the air pressure. Put on other personal protective equipment. Your employer may have written procedures that require other protective equipment like heavy-duty coveralls, long protective gloves, disposable coveralls, hearing protection, or safety eyewear. Check with your supervisor. Now, after you've completed these steps, you're ready to leave the clean environment and enter the abrasive blasting work area. Understand procedures for removing the respirator. When you take a break or when you're finished working for the day, it's important to remove the respirator properly and do it in a clean environment. Because when you stop blasting, the hazard isn't gone. Studies show that dangerous dust lingers in the air long after the blasting nozzle has turned off. What you can't see may hurt you, and it could kill you. Exit the contaminated area with the respirator on and the breathing air hose still connected. Do not disconnect the hose in the blasting environment, because if you do, dust, dirt, and debris can settle inside the air supply hose, and when it comes time to hook up again, the contaminants could shoot right inside the helmet. So remember, leave the blasting area wearing your respirator and with the air still flowing. Only disconnect in a clean environment. Store the blasting respirator away from the contaminated area. Do not leave your helmet in the blasting area because dust and dirt can settle inside it, contaminating it and exposing you to harmful dusts. So, my third point is, know how to use your respirator properly. Here are some steps you can take to make sure that your respirator works properly every time you use it. First, inspect the respirator daily. Before and after each use, inspect the respirator for worn or damaged parts. If damage is detected, replace those parts immediately or remove the respirator from service until new parts are available. Abrasive blasting respirators have a limited service life. Certain components, such as capes and lenses, need replacing frequently and other components should be replaced as necessary. Now, here's another thing that's really important, so listen up. Use approved replacement parts. You should never substitute respirator parts with non-approved parts or aftermarket parts. And let me tell you why. Your respirator was carefully designed and manufactured. So if you use non-approved parts, you can reduce your protection and put your life in danger. You also void the approval for that system. In other words, OSHA field officers can and may cite your employer for using non-approved parts or altering the respirator. This is the government's way of making sure your equipment is properly maintained. So, look for the manufacturer's logo or name on the parts to determine that all your respirator parts are approved. And if any one part isn't, you could expose yourself to hazardous or life-threatening conditions, and it's just not worth it. Use the respirator components as they were designed by the manufacturer and approved by NIOSH. Make sure the manufacturer's name is on all the major parts, including windows, capes, and breathing hoses. Do not modify or alter the respirator, or you could seriously jeopardize your health. For example, a lot of us are tempted to uh, remove the inner window operator. Well, then when we uh, take a break or stop for lunch, it's easy to just unlatch the outer window to eat or smoke. But hey, when you remove the inner window, the respirator doesn't provide you with the protection it was designed to provide. And if you modify it, you void the respirator approval I mentioned before. Also, when you open the outer window and put your hands inside the respirator, your hands could very well be contaminated with dust, lead, or other hazards from the work area. So you could actually put contaminants into the respirator yourself. Now, 
I don't want to say that's stupid, but that's stupid. <laughs> Clean your respirator regularly. The respirator should be cleaned and sanitized regularly by trained personnel. If the respirator is not cleaned, contamination may cause illness or disease. See your respirator instruction manual for details. As we mentioned before, store your respirator in a clean location. After inspection and cleaning, store the respirator components where they're protected from contamination and damage. Use an airtight plastic bag or airtight container. All components must be inspected, cleaned, and completely dried before they're stored. So the fourth point, maintain your respirator. In addition to the respirator instruction manual, there are materials to help you learn more about protecting yourself on the job. You might want to check them out. These include OSHA publications about respiratory protection, personal protective equipment, and working with lead in the construction industry. There are also NIOSH publications on preventing lead poisoning and silicosis. Lastly, your employer should have material safety data sheets from the supplier of your blasting media. Your employer can provide these and other tools to help you work safely. <laughs> Okay, now let's go back to the handsome characters I showed you earlier, and hopefully you recognize the procedures they've ignored. Together, they have violated just about everything we've covered. These guys modified their respirators by removing the inner window so they could just open the outer window to smoke and eat. They also should have washed their hands since they may have been contaminated with harmful dust from the work area. These dusts may now be inside their respirators, or even worse, inside their lungs and all of this for convenience. Okay, what about this guy? He avoided proper procedures for removing the respirator. He was running late and had to go home, so he took off the respirator in the work area. Not only was he unprotected, but harmful contaminants could have settled inside his respirator, so the next time he put it on, well, I think you get the idea. He thought he was safe, but you know he wasn't. Okay, let's be honest. How many of us want to deal with all of these safety procedures all the time? Right, nobody. But how many of us are going to be protected if we fudge these things? Right, nobody. This stuff not only makes sense, but it's the law. Your employer must have a program in place that covers everything we just talked about. Again, these aren't suggestions, they're the law. OSHA regulations state that your employer is responsible for a comprehensive respiratory program that includes standard operating procedures, respiratory selection, training, and maintenance. The program must address not only the person blasting, but everybody on the job site, pot tenders, sweepers, or any bystanders who are in the abrasive blasting area. Now, if you've still got questions after reading your instruction manual and seeing this video, ask them. Don't keep them to yourself. If your supervisor or safety coordinator can't answer your question, here's a toll-free number for you to call. It's 1-800-827-0423. Now, I know we've covered a lot of ground, but you, the blaster, cannot ignore the information presented here. Simply put, know the hazards of your environment. Wear an approved respirator, use your respirator properly, and maintain your respirator. Now, you may think that you're immune to the dangers of your environment, but you aren't. You may think that if you can't see the danger, it won't hurt you, but that's not true. Airborne contaminants you can't see may be present and deadly. To stay competitive in the marketplace, your employer needs healthy and productive employees, and that's you. And by using your protective equipment correctly, practicing safe work habits, and following your employer's respirator program, you can preserve your health and your job. Now, that's not necessarily quick and simple. 
but it is smart. Federal laws and employee requirements are there to protect you. Don't ignore that protection for short-term production gains. Use your respirator as if your life and your family's welfare depend on it, because for an abrasive blaster, it really does. We hope you found this video helpful, because at E.D. Bullard Company, we understand that there truly is a human side of safety.